Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Forester's Forecast. On today's episode, I got to interview a personal hero of mine. Dr. Tom Lynch is a retired biometrician from Oklahoma State University. He's led a very interesting career and we had a wonderful conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Help me welcome Dr. Tom Lynch. Welcome to the Forester's Forecast. I'm so happy to have you on the, the podcast. Welcome. Great to be here. Yeah. How you been doing? Good. I'm retired. And right now I'm in Kingsport, Tennessee, because I inherited my mother's house here and I have a lot of relatives in uh, mostly in Virginia, Southwest Virginia that I visit. But I also still have my house in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And I spend part of the year there. You know, I always like to find out why people tick, why they do what they do. And so you and I have had a couple of discussions, but I know you're, you're from Virginia. Can you just tell me like, you know, what was the process like growing up in Virginia and then getting involved in forestry and going to forestry school? Yeah, I was born in the Shenandoah Valley in Winchester, Virginia, which is in the Northern end of the Valley. And uh, I enjoyed our house was on the edge of town. Actually, it was in the county, but my dad was an engineer that worked uh, in Winchester, civil engineer. But I was able to walk because we were on the edge of town. I could walk out through pastures and woods, and I enjoyed uh, being around trees. I remember trying to transplant seedlings. You know, sometimes they grew and sometimes they didn't. My dad had been done some surveying and for that reason he had uh he knew a lot of the common names of trees that grew in the Shenandoah Valley and I learned that from him and then about the time uh, I started junior high we moved to Stanton Virginia which is further south in the in the valley and uh I became a voice one of my major activities in high school other than studying was I was a Boy Scout and I enjoyed, again, I enjoyed being outdoors, going on camping trips, hiking, and I did get the forestry merit badge. And I remember we had to make a leaf collection. And also we made it, that was my first D tape. For the merit badge, you had to make your own D tape. But you would get one of those cloth uh, tapes and mark off you know, pie, one pie, two pie inches on it. So I, I used that to measure my first DBH probably. How old were you when you made the, the D tape? I was probably maybe 15, 16, but I don't know exactly, but I was a teenager in Boy Scouts at some point. I think you can, yeah, I was probably 15, 16 or even 17. I was also interested in science. I was very, very interested in science. And I think in that era, like when I was a kid, uh, we could get up early in the morning and see the Mercury astronauts take off from Cape Canaveral. So, you know, science seemed exciting in those days. And I was interested in science. So when I considered going to college, studying forestry at Virginia Tech combined uh, my interest in trees and the outdoors with uh, sci also with science in my mind. Yeah. And so you did your um, undergrad at Virginia Tech and uh, uh, I hear you had some time with Mike Strube as one of your TAs. Yeah, I did my undergrad and master's at Virginia Tech. And I started in 70, the fall of 71. And yeah, I had, I had, I was thinking back, I had Mike, Mike was actually a, an instructor at one point. He had the title, he wasn't a, you know, a faculty member because he was still working on his doctorate in statistics, but he had a title of instructor, I believe. And I had him th for three classes. I had him for introductory statistics because in those days we had a separate uh, section of intro statistics for foresters. I had him for mensuration one. 
and I also had him for photogrammetry. So you had him in statistics and forestry. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. That was pretty interesting. I bet that was a fun time. Yeah. And I was just looking back. I was looking over some stuff before I got on the podcast. I noticed that he published a paper in 1975, which was the year I graduated. He and Harold published a paper called Cl something like Class Interval Free Volume Determination. And later, I'll talk about this when we talk about being at Purdue, but that led to uh, Dave Fink. And I was talking to him at the time about the Weibel distribution too, but Dave Fike came up with the idea of parameter recovery, which reversed what Mike did. Like Mike took parameters and predicted basal area or volume. If would, and uh, then by parameter recovery, if you had two equations, if you know basal area and another function of diameter, you can recover a two gram or Weibull distribution. But anyway, Mike Stroop's, like we looked at Mike Stroop's paper, I think Dave found it in the library. We looked at his paper and that was, you know, leading to parameter recovery in my, in my opinion. That's pretty interesting. So uh, in your undergrad, you were a forest management major or what, what did you do there? Yes, I was a, forest management major and uh i had uh, we had a l large classes then in the, in the 70s was a time when we had large forestry classes and i think it was because uh that was the first wave of kind of environmental consciousness but the universities didn't have a lot of the majors that they have now you know like you couldn't uh, major in, a, there wasn't an environmental science major commonly. So a lot of people, I think, enrolled in forestry because of the environmental consciousness, the first wave of environmental consciousness. Yeah, I think at Virginia Tech now, I mean, that's probably the main focus. Um, you know, the Department of Forestry got changed to the Department of Forest Resources and Environmental Conservation. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. And it was at least while I was there, the undergrad program was listed amongst the best programs in the U.S. for uh, forestry and environmental resources. So it's definitely a good program. Yeah, I think I was fortunate. To, uh, I went to Virginia Tech because that was the state forestry school, but I was fortunate. And they were actually in a time of growth and movement towards that excellence, I think. The director, John Hosner, was very dynamic and he had hired a number of uh, dynamic young uh, faculty who were young at that time, including Harold Burkhart would be the primary one for measurements, but, but there were also dynamic young faculty in other, other fields. Yeah, when I got there, you know, it was, um, he was still around. Uh, he would come into the office and, you know, he was pretty much a legend. And everyone that was there contributed the whole success of that forestry school to him. So um, it's a really interesting person and very fun to talk to. Right. As you know, he was later department head himself for a time. For a time. Yeah, I was greatly uh, influenced by uh, Harold to choose uh, biometrics, I think. I had, in those days, he taught undergraduate classes. He was quite young in the late 60s and early 70s, having come straight from the PhD program at the University of Georgia. And so he still taught undergraduate courses that uh, after they, some of these courses, after they hired Rich Oderwald, I think he mainly taught graduate classes after that. But before they hired Rich, he taught, uh, he didn't teach the first measurements course. That's what Mike Strube was teaching. And there were other grad students that, there were some of his grad students also taught it 
taught that later, but uh, he taught mensuration too, I guess. I can't remember exactly the title, but I think it was something like mensuration too, which happened just before camp. And in those days, Virginia Tech had a four week forestry camp and Harold actually taught at camp. Uh, believe it or not, now they don't have a camp anymore. I don't think, but uh, they call it a spring camp. Well, yeah, that's right. They call it a spring camp because in those days, Virginia Tech was on the quarter system, and the first half of the quarter we had concentrated classroom instruction. So I think we met measurements every day. Every day, I think for the first uh, half of the quarter. And then we moved to Farmville, Virginia and a, to a 4-H camp, let's see, near Farmville, maybe not in, it was near Appomattox actually. It was actually quite near the house where the surrender at Appomattox took place. Yeah, and they hit, but anyway, there was 4-H camp there and I, we had two weeks of civil cult, civil culture and two weeks of measurements. And looking back, I, th I actually think having hero for measurements is one of the things that caused me to become interested in biometrics because we collected data during the day and then at night we would work it up. And Harold already had us doing uh, linear regression, you know, even though we were undergrads, we did linear regression. And I thought it was really interesting that we could take this biological data and analyze it using math, using regression, and it actually worked quite, quite well. So I, th I thought maybe I would like to learn how to, how to do that. Yeah, I guess I had a similar inspiration when I was at undergrad at Stephen F. Austin. And then um, I actually was taking all of my mensuration and biometrics courses from Dean Coble. Right. Uh -huh. uh, then he invited, you know, students to work for the summer doing his research. And so I thought, um, you know, biometrics was going to be uh, very much field oriented and you're out there collecting data. And then, you know, the farther you go and the higher up you go, the less time you spend in the field. So, <laughs> um, that was the reason I chose it and really due to, to Dean Coble. And, you know, if you know, Dean, he's just such a personable guy. And, uh, Oh yeah, I know. De I've known Dean for years. So yeah, really easy to get along with. And so, um, he was my inspiration. Um, but so Harold inspired you, but when you got, you finished your undergrad and went directly to the master's program and Harold had, gone off to New Zealand on sabbatical or something, right? So you... Well, uh, not the first year. Yeah, I, I talked with Harold about going to the program and he helped me, you know, become a grad student. And he was still there the first year uh, of my program. But the second year when I would have graduated and really finished my thesis, he was in New Zealand. He was going to be in New Zealand. So he couldn't be on my, uh, actually be on my committee because he wasn't going to be there when my thesis was being read. But he helped propose the topic. Like he suggested, well, maybe you would be interested in, I took a logging class and I thought that was interesting. So as a senior from uh, Dr. Stewart, who's passed away now, but Dr. Stewart taught a logging class and he was kind of a charismatic guy. So I thought that was interesting. And Harold said, well, maybe you would like to do study the engineering characteristics of trees, including the center of gravity and the moment of inertia. And he thought, uh, I give him a lot of credit for having this insight, but he realized the uh, the tree volume data set they had and it also had weight weight and data weight uh, data set they had could probably be used to calculate center of gravity and moments of inertia for tree stems 
and that turned out to be true to be correct. So I wrote a program that did that, and I fitted a regression uh, to predict center of gravity and moments of inertia for uh, you know Loblolly pine stumps. And your major was Tim Max, the famous Tim Max. Yeah. So since Harold, well, he might have been my major prof anyway, but Harold was gone to New Zealand and Tim Max and Rich Oderwald had just been hired the year I, about the year, maybe it was slightly before, but close to the time I started. So my, my major professor was Tim Max. And most biometricians will know about him from the Max Burkhart taper equation. Yeah, I think that's Harold's most uh, cited publication, right? Is that right? Yeah. I think so. I think much more than anything else that he published, that one has just been published or cited in every taper equation paper in existence. Yeah. Yeah, that's just one of those equations that just works a lot of the time. I was thinking about equations that worked in my career, like they say, just works very often. Might include the Max Burkhart Taper equation, the Chapman Richards equation for nonlinear stuff, the Weibull diameter distribution, the combined variable uh, uh, equation for you know for linear uh, regression for tree volume and weight. Some of those equations just seem to work well on a lot of data. Not all. Not, I'm not saying they're always best. That's not would not be true. But during my career, they worked pretty well for a lot of data sets. Right. So it's my understanding that um, Tim Max had came from a mathematics background, like he wasn't a traditional forester. That's right. Uh, he got his doctorate at Iowa State. And he was a math major at Iowa State. But he, uh, now I'm having a brain freeze on his first major professor, but uh, who was the guy that did partial replacement sampling with par uh, Ware? Uh, Dr. Ware, uh, Ken Ware, somehow got to know Tim Max. I'm not sure how they got to know each other, but, you know, he recruited him in to get a uh, doctorate in uh, biometrics. And he took probably most of the, or, you know, many of the stat graduate classes at Iowa State, which at that time was, and still is a top statistics school. And of course, he already had the math right from when he started he had the he didn't have to take any uh you know remedial math he already had all the math so he could start right out taking uh grad level stat theory courses and he encouraged me to take more math than people were typically taking at that time and that got me interested in math in math i took more math at purdue and uh, I got kind of interested in math, in math applying it to uh, forestry. Like he uh, encouraged me to take advanced calculus in my master's, which most people were not taking at that time. But I actually did have, my first year of grad school, I had to take some remedial undergrad math as well. Yeah, I was fortunate that I knew from a sophomore that I wanted to do a master's in biometrics. So Dean Coble recommended that I take, you know, as much math as possible up through differential calculus. So when everyone else was taking like bass fishing for their electives, I was in trigonometry and pre-cal. <laughs> yeah. So, but worked out well in the end. <laughs> Actually, in those days, it seems like we've kind of regressed in math requirements at least at Oklahoma State. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but like now we only require algebra at Oklahoma State. Yeah, I think that was all that I was required in the undergrad at SFA was uh, algebra. I think just one algebra class. It might have been two, but 
not beyond algebra. Anyway, at Virginia Tech in those days, they re, they actually required calculus, but it was the calculus that biology students would would take. So I did. I had taken some calculus, and then I decided in my senior year to go to, into biometrics. So Harold Harold recommended that I could skip the first semester of quote unquote engineering calculus and take the second semester. And that worked out. But those um, courses like the calculus for biology and calculus for engineers tends to be much more applied. And I wish we had had some kind of calculus for <laughs> forestry majors, although there would only be five people in that course every other year. But um, the I think the applied part of it really helps people connect the dots and why it's so important. So I didn't, when I took calculus and understanding growth rates from functions, I, it wasn't easy to connect the dots to forestry, right? To why do trees grow the way they do? What does the inflection point mean? That sort of thing. Um, so I wish I had had a calculus for biology or something that might've been very helpful. It helped, calculus helped me immediately in my grad program because I had to learn, go back and learn how to calculate the moment of inertia of a tree. And uh, engineering calculus books have uh, the slices and the cylindrical shells method, you do that. So I had done that in uh, you know, my calculus class. And that's pretty interesting that you got that in the master's uh, degree, you know, working with different wood properties is just not something I've ever done because I've never had to, you know, be a part of any kind of research involved in that. But uh, understanding, you know, how the forest management can affect wood structure, which affects the, you know, quality of the lumber down the road. I think that's all very interesting. The whole you get the whole kind of pipeline of events and you get to understand all the pieces through the value chain. Well, at that time, Harold had a weight study data set, and I think there were four foot bolts. And at the top of each bolt, there was, a, you know, they had weighed a green disc with and without bark. And they also, and then they sent it back to tech and dried it and got the dry biomass. But I needed to use the, because I was looking at the center of gravity and moment of inertia of a green tree stem, I needed to use the green disc weight. And of course, uh, got the density and spread that over the four foot bolt. And I actually calculated the center of gravity and moment of inertia for each four foot bolt. And then there's a theorem you can use called the parallel axis theorem that you can use to combine them all to get the center of gravity for the whole stem. Finn, you published a paper from that uh, master's work. I did. Unfor I have to, I'm kind of ashamed to admit it was a long time after I had done it. Only two years. That's not so bad. But we later uh, published a paper and here was on the paper because it was actually his idea. Like I implemented it, but it was his idea to do that. And I think he had a lot of insight into realizing, even though he didn't have training in engineering, he realized their weight study data could probably be used to find those quantities. Unfortunately, it hasn't been cited a lot because, you know, we thought it might be used in machine design, but there hasn't been a lot of follow up in that area in forestry. There have been a few papers published in that area, but not a lot. Not a lot. I think there was a, a paper published in Italy. There were some uh, Forest Service research publications in that area that were published. Of course, as you can, and there was a fellow at Auburn, a mechanical engineer at Auburn, that published a paper on it, on moment of inertia of tree stems. Yeah, sometimes those good ideas just don't pick up. Um, I, in my master's degree, I worked on stand table projection and using the method of Pinar and Harrison, and you know that really hasn't been touched since 1986 or whenever it was published. So sometimes you see those good ideas that just don't catch on really well. Yeah, and you don't know at the time 
you usually don't know at the time what's going to catch on and what isn't. Yeah, right. So after you finish up your master's, was it, you know, towards the end you decided to get a PhD or were you on the fence to go work or how did how did that happen? I didn't necessarily intend to get a PhD when I started, but uh, in my second year, I decided I wanted, wanted to get a PhD. And I thought since I had two degrees from Virginia Tech, it might be good to look at going somewhere else. So I asked Tim Max for some suggestions. And I wrote to several schools. That was before email, you know, of course. So I wrote to several schools. And the best offer I got was uh, from Purdue. Uh, John Moser actually called me. And it turned out they were looking for, they were actually looking for someone to get a graduate degree and teach the me- teach a measurements course because at that time they had high enrollment and Purdue had a cap on how many students you could have in a class. So uh, they didn't want to hire another full-time faculty member. So they hired me to teach a section of measurements for two years and it paid well for the time. I think I made $10,000 a year, whereas I believe my graduate assistantship at Virginia Tech, I think, was something like $4,000 a year. I bet the cost of tuition was significantly less than it is now. (laughs) Oh, yeah, right. And in some places, I I think at Purdue, tuition was waived. Some schools waived it, some didn't, some didn't. So uh, that seemed like a good deal at the time. At the time, and it was a great experience uh, to do that. So I went to Purdue, worked under John Moser, and I taught measurements. And I, in teaching measurements, I had the opportunity to work under uh, two men who wrote a book, a measurements book that's still one of the main. It's been updated by John Kershaw, but it's still one of the main measurements books used in the United States, forced measurement. So I worked with Tom Beers and uh, Charlie Miller on teaching. And I uh, actually followed Charlie Miller. Charlie Miller normally taught the measurements course, and I followed his patterns and notes actually like the first the first semester i i taught one of the uh lab sections in charlie's class and i set this class for lectures and then the second semester i taught uh you know the lecture and one of the lab sections and i had a ta uh charlie minogue a fellow named charlie mcnogue was a ta who he got a master's from Tom Beers. And the way they designed the course, they really liked point sampling. And in fact, the reason they wrote the book, uh, it's hard to think that in the 60s, point sampling was just getting started. And uh, Tom Beers was, had been at Penn State, and he really liked the H.A. Myers book. But H.A. Myers died before his book could be revised to include point sampling. So there was no point sampling in it at all. So uh, one of the reasons they wrote a book was to have a book that had a good uh, coverage of point sampling. And so that meant I really got into point sampling and I enjoyed it. And uh, I thought it was cool. And you know, when you teach something, you learn it, get a much deeper knowledge of it than when you're just taking a, taking a class. So I got a really good knowledge of point sampling, and I think that uh, helped me uh, develop a later research interest in point sampling. In fact, I had some research ideas in point sampling when I was still at Purdue. At Purdue. 
And your work, of course, is, you know, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but you've done quite a bit of work with sampling um, and various sampling techniques. Um, so you can see your kind of influence from, you know, those people that you studied with and learned from at Purdue and Virginia Tech, for sure. Yeah, they also had a good sampling class in the uh, statistics department that I, I took the graduate level stat sampling course in statistics that covered uh, Cochran's 1977 sampling techniques book. And that, that was good. But my thesis was not on sampling. It was on John Moser's specialty was growth and yield. So my thesis was actually on, on growth and yield. Yeah. Diameter distributions in mixed species forest stands, which of course, if you're coming from Purdue, that would be, wouldn't be loblolly pine for sure. Right. We were not in the loblolly pine paradigm. So, uh, uh, you know, John was interested in differential equations and he really liked uh, Clutter's work, the, the original Clutter work that was done in original, in, uh, you know, differential equations in the South. So he adapted, he wanted to adapt it to uneven age forest. And in those days, it was considered a barrier that, you know, you can't really measure the age of an uneven age forest. But for the Schumacher model that Clutter used, Schumacher yield model has age as an independent variable. So you could not use, you could not really use the Schumacher model for uneven age forest. So uh, John found the, uh, I think he had an, I don't know what the first, I don't know who had the earliest application of the uh, Chapman Richards equation in forestry, but John's was early. It was early. And with the Chapman Richards equation, the growth rate depends on organism size, not on age. If you look at it in the differential form, in the differential form, it depends on uh, organism size, not age. So in the late, I think in 1968 or nine, he did a dis he did a dissertation using a differential equation growth model for uneven age stands using uh, the Chapman Richards model. I think he may have got it from Turnbull. Uh, Turnbull in the Pacific Northwest. He, he might have been one of the very first to use the Chapman Richards equation in his the in his uh, thesis but I'm not sure if he published it. But then Leon Pinar was one of Turnbull's students. And you may remember that Leon, Leon Pinar, shortly after John's publication came out, Leon Pinar published what might be the seminal Chapman Richards equation publication in the early 70s that a lot of people uh, cite. Anyway, John was into uh, growth and yield. He was also interested in systems of equations instead of just one equation. So he published on systems of equations. For example, he'd have a system including a differential equations for uh, number of trees, which would include mortality in an uneven age stance. You also have to include in in growth, basal area, and uh, volume. So I think uh, dealing with equation systems was also something I got from John. And I later did several publications that use systems of equations like biomass. Recently in my career, I had uh, biomass model systems and equations for biomass components. Of course, a lot of people have been doing that, but. You worked with uh, Dehai on uh, Dehai Zhao from University of Georgia on a few of his biomass publications, right? Where he's using systems of equations. Right. The most recent one came out last year. And I think what was kind of new on that was we used an econometric method called uh, full information maximum likelihood. 
And like three stage least squares, that allows you to use the predicted variable from one equation as the independent variable in a different equation. So for example, we used branch biomass as the, we had an equation predicting branch biomass and then that use that as an independent variable for uh, foliage biomass, which would make sense that foliage might be, you know, roughly dependent on branches. Yeah, I'm pretty familiar with those systems. I've been using them quite a bit myself in my work. Um, you know, with the carbon world the way it is today, a lot of, you know, people are relying on uh, basically these publications from Dr. Jennifer Jenkins and you know these are just like very broad biomass equations they're based on diameter alone and very broad species groups and you know I keep saying yeah that's great when you don't have anything else but Deha has published this amazing set of systems of equations for uh, blah blah lee and uh, slash pine so why don't we use those? They're really guys. <laughs> yeah, I was also a co-author on one that he had for, uh, I think, it was, I can't remember, Slash or La Valley, but that used seemingly unrelated regression. So it was all fitted as a, as a system. And then we got started working together with a compatible taper and, uh, and volume ratio equation system. That's a little bit different, but but anyway, going back to John, do you want to go back to John? Yeah. So he had me do. Uh, anyway, he had Dave Hank as one of his students, PhD students. He was a little. Dave was a couple years ahead of me, but we our time overlapped for probably a year and a half, I think. And we took a class, we took theoretical statistics together, actually in the same class. But uh, so John assigned Dave to uh, do see if the, he could use diameter distribution modeling with uneven age forest, which he did. And that was fairly, it's hard to believe, but back, this is the late 70s, so 79. 80 that was still relatively new relatively new believe it or not because uh i think the weibel the bailey and dale weibel publication was in the early early to mid 70s so it had not been that long before really so i learned a lot about the weibel distribution from dave and since we had both had math stat we had you know the mathematical understanding to understand the Weibull distribution pretty pretty well, at least as far as it's applying to forestry. That was where the whole parameter recovery started. Was with Dave Hank and you working on this Weibull distributions. Yeah, it was. I, I think Dave came up with the idea. He came in at one morning with the idea, but we had been talking about this whole a area. And for example, Strubes. Like we studied Mike Strube's uh, parameter uh, well, his uh, volume prediction system, class interval free volume prediction system. And it came about that you could do parameter recovery by inverting that by having the predicted or known basal area uh, volume or sum of diameters and recovering the parameters from it. And the advantage of that was, if you look at some of the early uh, Weibull or beta uh, yield prediction systems, they predicted the parameters directly, but there wasn't, they didn't really know, there wasn't a theory for how they should behave with time, you know? But when we look at volume or basal area, we know we have a theoretical basis for their behavior in time. Like a sigmoid curve, such as the Chapman Richards or other sigmoid curve shape. So we had a better, we thought we had a better theoretical basis 
for uh, yield prediction and didn't recover the parameters from the predictions in application. Whereas before, what they did at the University of Georgia or Virginia Tech, for the most part, was they fitted libel distributions to every plot and they got a set of parameters, or they also used percentiles as well, but uh, parameters and percentiles, and then they fitted regressions to those. Right, but the parameter recovery is primarily what we use now, right? I mean, if, if... I think a lot of people, that's something a lot of people have used, I think. And uh, I used it in my, the my thesis. And I should mention Tom Matney came out with a very similar paper about the same time. He used volume and basal, basal area. So I'm not sure which one was put was actually published first, but uh, Dave coined the term parameter recovery. Other, other interesting things that were kind of interesting for a new grad student to do were, it turns out for, for even age stands, uh, most of the data sets started at four inches. So they were actually truncated. It wasn't like plantations where the tail went to zero. So it was really better to use a truncated distribution. And there was a lot of paper uh, papers on censored distributions, but for censored distributions, you have to know the number of trees below the censoring point, and we never knew the data sets didn't have that. So the I think Dave found a paper on the truncated distribution, but it didn't have the likelihood equations. So we worked on deriving and did derive likelihood equations for the truncated distribution by following the pattern in, uh, like there was a book that had the equations for the non-truncated distribution. And by following the calculus to get that, we just did the same thing with the truncated distribution and it, wor and it worked. Uh, and what I mean there is, like today, you could just uh, maximize the likelihood function directly, probably, but then you wanted to get the likelihood, nor the normal equations. You know, for us, you guys were like at the beginning of all of this work. And when I say yes, I mean, you know, people like me who are early to mid-career. You know, now the, the hot topics are machine learning methods and, you know, integrating with the remote sensing data and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All of these, um, basically these parametric methods that y'all developed in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, you know, that's still kind of the uh, cornerstone for all of the work that we're doing today, um, you know, that's not machine learning, basically. I mean, um, all of our systems are based on systems of equations and differential equations, and so, um, it's interesting to hear that uh, history, though, of, you know, basically you and Dave sitting in your office, like solving equations and working on maximum likelihood. That's, man, that had to have been a fun time. Yeah, and we had just learned about it. Actually, I had a class, I had a previous class in Virginia Tech where we learned something about it. But we had just taken this class on, you know, mathematical statistics that explained maximum likelihood. And then even during that time or right after class, we were applying it to our, re our research, you know, by getting the likelihood function for the truncated Bible, the left truncated Bible. And later people looked at the right truncated Bible also, I know, and, and all other kinds of variations as well. Well, after you finished up your PhD, you went directly to a position at Oklahoma State? Yes. Uh, there were a couple of jobs open that year and Oklahoma State was one of them. And uh, it seems like that year was not that great for industry for some reason. Like when times were good, they would hire. And if there were times that were not that good, they would not, they didn't hire as much. So, and now most of them don't even own any land, but that's another story. 
that's another story. But yeah, I went to Oklahoma State and uh, in 1982. And it turns out that Harold had his undergrad degree from Oklahoma State. I find it interesting. You guys just kind of traded places. Right. And some of his professors, like the professor, Dave Robinson, the professor who taught Harold Mitzeration, uh, was still teaching at Oklahoma State when I got there. And But you being from, you know, you went to from Virginia, went to Virginia Tech, went to Purdue. I mean, Oklahoma State must have been a completely different place for you because, I mean, the terrain and the species you're working with and the problems just had to be quite a bit different than what you were used to. Yeah, I had never been in Oklahoma until I went on my interview trip, actually. Actually, some of the species are not as different as you would think because a lot of the timber related forestry is in eastern and southeastern Oklahoma, which borders Arkansas. So they, and you, you probably know that, but they have a lot of the hardwood, the same hardwood species that you would have in the Appalachians. A shortleaf pine was a bigger thing, but a lot of the rest of the South also has shortleaf pine. And they have, uh, you know, where when I got there, warehouser was uh, blowing and going, planting uh, lovely pine plantations in southeast Oklahoma. It had not been that long. Well, I think they had their land there for maybe 10, only about 10, 12 years. And I think they were they were still converting some of the natural shortleaf stands they had bought to lovely pine plantations. I have not actually been to Oklahoma, that part of Oklahoma where there's actually forests. So I, while I'm from East Texas, I've just never been to that part of the world. I've never had any reason to go there. So um, I, I realize that there's probably similar species just like we had down in East Texas, but the, the hardwood markets maybe, I guess, would be a lot different than they were in the, uh, in the Appalachians and the Blue Ridge Mountains. Yeah, my sense is there's not, I didn't work with hardwood hardly at all, but uh, my sense is there's not a lot of quality hardwood there. But they do need hardwood for the mix. They definitely harvest hardwood for the pulpwood mix. They have a world class, uh, you know, paper mill in uh, Southeast Oklahoma. It was built by Weyerhaeuser, but after all of the uh, gyra, as you know, Weyerhaeuser chose to keep their land. So, but they had to sell a lot of their manufacturing facilities. So they sold their paper mill in Southeast Oklahoma to, uh, in Valiant, Oklahoma to uh, International Paper, I, you know. And I know they take a large percentage of hardwood for their mix. I, I don't remember what it is, but. You know, in addition to pine, they have uh, har locally harvested hardwood too. But I don't think there's a lot of high quality hardwood like for furniture in here or anything like that. Well, um, you know, on your teaching experience, because you got to Oklahoma State, you were, um, I think you indicated that you were 70% research and 30% teaching. Was that throughout your whole career at Oklahoma State? was pretty close to that throughout my career. However, it, like it, but at times that meant I taught as many as three classes. And at other times it might have been less, but uh, at the end of my career, I taught measurements on campus. And I also taught a two week measurements field class at camp. And I also taught, oh yeah, I also taught biometrics. We had an undergraduate biometrics class that I taught for many years. I'm curious what you did in your undergrad biometrics class. Like what was it focused on? Was it modeling or sampling or all of the above? It was all, all of the above. And uh, I modeled it somewhat on classes I had taken at Virginia Tech. So I ask, I took, I don't know if you can see this book. This is the what I took for biometrics. 
sampling techniques for forest resource inventory, Shiver and Borders. Yeah, well, I know that book. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. And I actually just randomly have it right here because I was, um, whenever I was kind of reviewing for the podcast and, you know, some of your research is on big BAF. Um, and so I was getting back into my, you know, notes on uh, double sampling and uh, how those are working together. And it's also it a, a nice little segue because, you know, Bruce Borders is, um, you know, the author on this book with Barry Shivers. But you and Bruce Borders recently have a publication with uh, Mark Ducey and I can't remember who else. on uh, Dave Hamlin. Yeah, on plantation row sampling, and that's one of right. the one of the papers that I really wanted to talk to you about because I I remember when Bruce gave his presentation at a Southern Menstruationist meeting on this you know new technique he was working on for plantation row sampling, and then you finally um, have published a paper on it, so you kind of took up the the charge on that. So I'm curious if you can you just go ahead and explain to the listeners what what is plantation row sampling, how it might differ from a point sample or a plot sample. Yeah, in the plantation row sampling, your population isn't really the land area; it's the length of row, the total length of rows in the plantation. So you assign points not area-based, but based on the length of that row, right? Based on the length of that row. So if you have a skipped row, you go on to the ne next row, uh, if that makes sense. So anyway, the population is the row. So like Bruce had kind of a ratio estimator where you had sample row segments and would predict number of trees per lineal foot or volume per lineal foot average, you know, using a ratio type estimator. And then you get total estimates by, not by multiplying by area, but by multiplying by the total row length. And the assumption is that you could use remote sensing to determine the total row length. Yeah, so the the sampling procedure is first determine total row length. Yeah. Then randomly assign points across your stand, but the points have to be in the row. It's not like between rows. It's in a row between. Yeah, the ideally, the tree. ideally, you should get a random length on that row. Mm hmm and then measure yeah. out on the row with a remote sensing tool if, if you can't or whatever that length on the row yeah but the the total row length is not individual rows it's the total row length of all rows in a stand yeah ideally it would be the total length of all rows on the stand i mean you could break it up into portions maybe and sample individual rows maybe but our idea was you have the total row length of all rows on the stand. And I think that's what Bruce proposed. He thought that could be measured remote sen with remote sensing. Yeah, I guess, you know, in a, probably a very well manicured stand where the rows are more or less straight and don't follow contours, it probably works out okay. But whenever you have quite a bit of terrain and you have, you know, uneven rows. And I, I think that that could become complicated, especially after, you know, some years when you have crown closure and you get volunteers and, you know, sometimes it might be very hard to determine what's actually the row. Right. Well, you would have to, in this concept, you'd have to determine the row, I think. Yeah. And so my, my question to you is, you know, it, at least in that sampling scheme, it seems like row length does not contain variation. It is, you know, the actual value. So if there is somehow variation in that, what does it do to the whole? No, there could be variation in row length, but you would have to measure. Ideally, if you could do this with remote sensing, you would like to measure the total length of all the rows. 
like the first row plus the second row plus the third row, adding them all up, their total length. And they could be curved. They wouldn't have to be straight if you're able to measure on a curve. I guess my, my, my concern is that, you know, it, it could become a point where it's so difficult to determine rows that it might even be impossible to do such a thing uh, because of just the way that, you know, they're laid out. You know, if they're not exactly straight and you can't go in between, you know, you can't see in between the rows because of volunteers or crown closure or whatever. Um, and I, I think the whole procedure just hinges on that being able to calculate row length, right? Well, you could you could develop what I might call virtual rows with remote sensing. You could maybe lay out the straightest uh, segmented line on the on each row and add them up. But then you would in the field you would want to use GPS to place your point on that virtual row. I might say. So my next question was the because it's not area based it's the 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 sample is the length of the rows right and you're randomly mm -hmm. putting these kind of one dimensional points well I, I say points they're not actual points but these one dimensional like the, the row is one dimensional and the point is zero, yeah. zero right. dimensional so in this case you know you're measuring trees along the length of the row you know it's i think in your paper you had some fixed number of trees or something or a fixed distance um but what about you know when we get volunteers in between the rows how did those factor into the whole sampling scheme well you would have to decide if you want to include them as trees or you don't if you're only sampling rows and the row length is important then how does that even, you know, between rows, how does that even factor in? Well, you could project project a tree back to its nearest row. That's what I would do, if that makes sense. So, I mean, but it's, again, it's not going to be area-based, so you're just going to have to say if I'm on this row and there's a tree, you know, less than half the distance between the next row, then count it basically well you could like you could do a i think you could do a perpendicular projection to the nearest row it's one thing you could it's one thing you could do i think bruce is i, I haven't done this in the field but i think bruce had, i believe he has done it in the field that was going to be my next my very next question because i've seen a, a couple papers comparing uh different double sampling techniques but so far i haven't seen any anything i mean you have the most uh, recent paper on this row sampling plantation row sampling and i haven't seen any actual comparison of you know this actually being performed in the field time wise is it faster you know does it reduce variation or is it better than point plot sampling you know that sort of thing yeah i think bruce might have some of those numbers but since he works in industry, he's not publishing them. But you could probably call him. And uh, I haven't seen much of him late, lately at, at meetings. But uh, I wanted to say the way this came about originally was, like, you can do something similar if there aren't any rows. Because, uh, you know, you, it could be like line sampling. Because I... What happened is during that year, I went to the Northeast Forest, the Northeast uh, Forest Measurements Conference, and Mark Ducey presented a paper on a technique for line sampling uh, with a fixed number of trees, like two trees, four trees, or whatever on a line. And it was the nice thing, the cool thing about it is. His technique is uh, design unbiased. But in his technique, you lay out a length of line and you get uh, distances parallel to the line for trees within a certain width, like strip, like strip sampling, except you're only concerned with the distance uh, along the line. Okay, and then. And then I saw Bruce's deal on population on uh, plantation row sampling, and I thought, man, this would be ideal for a Marx technique because we could use 
we already have the line. We have the row that's already the line laid out. Yeah. I just, um, I again wonder, you know, if you have like a, you know, 10% variation in total row lengths, what that might do to your sample. Whereas whenever you're doing a, a plot or a point, you don't have a similar issue, right? You mean the sample row, the sample row lengths? Yeah, because if you have if you're doing an area based sample, you know what area you're sampling. If you're doing a row sampling, and that you, the, again, the entire thing hinges on you knowing the length of the row. If you don't know L, yeah, I think it, yeah, I see what you mean. That's why, like. Most of the techniques are not designed unbiased for that reason. It's you have a ratio, and I should have explained this from the beginning, but you have a fixed number of trees, like maybe you're going to do four trees, and uh, you measure the length of row that those four trees occupy. And there's different ways you can do that. You can do that from midpoint of the first gap to the midpoint of the second gap or from the first from the you know from the first subsequent tree online or there's different ways you can do that and we looked at that we did simulations on that but then you actually but then the row length is a random variable so in Bruce's concept you actually have a ratio estimator right you have in the denominator, you have the average row length, which is a random variable. In the numerator, you have whatever you measured on the trees, like volume on the trees, the average volume on, on trees per row segment. So it's a ratio estimator. But And ratio estimators are, are not unbiased. They're not design unbiased, but they often have small Oftentimes, they in actuality, they have many times negligible bias. But they could have potentially have very large bias. I'd have to go back and look at my notes what the largest we found. We had several different options. One was a very clumpy row with big gaps. You know, one was fairly uniform, and another one just had random gaps. But if you use Mark's technique, actually, since Mark's technique is designed unbiased, it wouldn't matter if you used his technique, no matter how clumpy it is, it would be unbiased. And uh, it's if you get into his technique for a large number of trees, it's more complex. But suppose you're just going to select two trees. You're going to put a random point on, a row, on the totality of rows in the forest. There's going to be a random point there, and you're going to measure the two trees, the one in front of the point, and the one behind the point. Okay. So the probability of picking those two trees is the gap divided by the totality of row length. Okay, so if you blow up the sum of the two tree volumes by that inverse probability, you have a design unbiased estimator. How does it work with, um, you know, like thin stands? Um, do you remove the rows that the the take rows? So now you have rows that are missing. Do those are no longer counted, or they're counted in the total row length still, and you still count them as a no tally plot if it randomly falls? Well, if there weren't any, if you did a row thinning where there were no trees, if you completely moved, removed a row, I wouldn't include it. You just don't include that in your total row length anymore. Right. But it's very, if you do that, it's very important to assign your point along the row length, not randomly in the area. Because if you assign it randomly in the area, the points are more likely to fall in those gaps. But so in, you know, say just a uh, plot, plot cruising where you have a fixed area plot, you know, if we place those you know, in a in a thin stand, you know, they will pick up the down rows, the the take rows, the green rows, whatever. They'll pick up everything. They'll pick up all that variation. But now if you're doing a plantation row sampling and you're randomly locating points, you have the potential for oversampling or undersampling, you know, those different row types, right? 
Well, if you, but the thing is, if you use uh, Mark's technique, it doesn't matter because you'll blow it up by the inverse probability. Uh, and I think some problems I've heard with with circular plots or points is, is their bias locating the center point? You know, do crews tend to locate it in between rows? Because it, that might be easier or on rows, you know? You know, essentially, if you are doing a random plot or point location, whatever you want to call it along the row, I mean, you could have some bias there, too, on where you're putting that point, right? Or it doesn't matter with Mark. Uh, not, if, not if you randomly allocate it along the totality of row length. Yeah. It doesn't, it basically just doesn't matter. No. Not for Mark, for Mark's technique, especially. It wouldn't matter if it falls in a gap. It will be blown up by a larger probability. Actually, the inverse probability will be, will be smaller. If it falls in a small gap, it will be, you know, blown up by a smaller probability. So the probabilities would adjust for different gap sizes, even if they were thin. You know, even if you had thinning, creating some large gap sizes. Yeah, I saw your simulation study, but you, uh, it didn't seem like you were looking at thinning or how, how you weren't comparing any of those methods and how it might work in different um, forest types. Well, we tried to do that by using clumped, random, and uniform stands. And the clumped ones could have been some kind of thin stand. Yeah. Um, the Virginia Tech, you know, the, the modeling co-op now has this simulator. I think it would be interesting to put some of this uh, to the test through their simulator. It's basically using potato to generate a, you know, a large forest and under different kinds of variation. I think it would be very interesting to see that happen. But even further than that, I would be very interested to see this actually applied in the field and see how much time it takes and how it might compare to a traditional point or plot cruise. I'm surprised there would be a lot of interest in it, actually. <laughs> I think there might be, actually. Um, but of course, we continue to do the same thing we always do, and we've got for sampling pretty much figured out at this point. But, you know, it's always nice to see something new and to test new things. I'm kind of thinking maybe remote sensing would make all all this kind of thing irre close to irrelevant, maybe. Eventually, maybe. But it's a lot of data. Um, are you familiar with the company called TreeSwift? I think we talked about that before. Of course, you could do... You could do plantation row sampling with with drones conceptually. If you can't measure the whole forest, you could measure a lot, you know, sample line segments. You could do that. Yeah. I, I, I guess the issue is um, when you're using drones or some kind of remote sensing, if you're doing LIDAR, if you're doing photogrammetry, you're doing all of the above, the amount of data adds up quickly and the processing and the processing time adds up quickly. And so what TreeSwift is doing is they're doing traditional forest sampling, but they're measuring the plots, fixed area plots with drones. Um, I don't know if they're doing circular plots or rectangular plots. It seems to me if you have a drone and you have rows that are pretty much, you know, straight that a, a rectangle rectangular plot might work better than trying to do a circular plot there. Um, but I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I think we're still not away from forest sampling. We're not doing wall-to-wall -wall inventories with LIDAR yet. I've also, because there might be a problem with starting points, I've also thought about what if you did strips, per, what if you did uh, fixed length strips perpendicular to rows that would, would cross several rows? I don't know. You know, I don't have too much experience with strip sampling. Maybe you do, but the original issues with strip sampling were you didn't have plots, right? You just had one continuous strip, basically. 
So, but there's no reason you couldn't have just short kind of rectangular plots that are strips, but it's not a full, you know, strip sample. Yeah, one reason I thought of that is uh, Beers and Miller proposed that for uh, what they called uh, horizontal line sampling. They proposed hor proposed fixed length strips where you would, uh, you know, take your angle gauge perpendicular to the center line. So it's kind of like a rate, you could think of it as a rectangular plot with the near with the width being narrow. Yeah. So uh, another sampling technique that I want to talk about that you've been working on is this big BAF. And so big BAF, I'm going to let you explain it, but it falls under an area of double sampling, right? It's similar, but slightly different than double sampling. And in traditional double sampling, like you would see in the force measurements book, all the sample units are the same size. So if you use plots, all the plots are the same size. Or if you use uh, point sampling, uh, the basal area factor is the same at every point. And in traditional dub sa double sampling with uh, angle count with a prism, you take a prism count at every point and at maybe a quarter of the points you take a prism count and measure diameters and heights as well so you can get volume. But big B, big bay, BAF is somewhat different from that because you have two different at every plot at every location in the field you have two different sample units like you have two different prism sa sizes. You have a small BAF where you count all of the trees that are in, and that gives you basal area per acre, but you don't make any measurements on them. And then you have the big BAF that counts fewer trees closer to the plot center or point center, but you take, usually you would measure height and diameter to get a fairly precise volume measurement. So I guess the whole point of double sampling in general is that you can reduce time and therefore costs of sampling by only sampling us, you know, actually measuring on small a smaller number. number of samples, right? So exactly. It, yeah. yeah. And this is the same concept is that you wouldn't have to spend as much time doing the measurements, right? Because you're taking us measurements on a smaller number. Uh, right. But the, the, yeah, I get it that you would oversample or, you know, oversampling large trees is, is with all point sampling, but also if you're gonna measure those trees, then you're also over kind of oversampling. I get it, it's taken into account, but you're under or undersampling the smaller trees. Right, but if you're but if you're interested in volume per acre, it doesn't matter. I guess it depends on what you want to do, what you want to do. But I might go on to add that uh, the estimator, the big BAF estimator, can be looked at as a ratio estimator, like double sampling. You have the ratio between on the large BAF that gets smaller number of trees. You take the ratio between volume per acre and basal area per acre, and then you multiply that by the more precise estimate of basal area per acre that you get from simply counts on the small BAF. Yeah. Have you seen any studies that compare that, like time wise, if it's, uh, you know, if it is much more efficient than just, you know, measuring everything or? I mean, I'm sure it's faster, but it depends on which BAF you pick. I'm just curious if there's a study out there because I couldn't find one. There's a few simulation studies. Um, I think Shenzhen, uh, I, at Tennessee. Yeah, Shenzhen. He's done a simulation I, study. He did, he did that for us. He did something like that for his uh, doctoral thesis. Yeah, I actually have it printed out over here. Um, 
that's a very nice paper. But again, it's just another simulation uh, study. And John John Kershaw has also done some work on that. I think he had some maybe some field studies and simulations. But if you're just looking at variants, well, we did simulations in our study. Actually, we did two two papers, but in in our studies, which were which used Jeff, like my co-author Jeff Gove, has uh, a simulator, uh, a very nice simulator for point sampling and also other types of sampling. And uh, we found uh, the variance for big BAF sampling uh, many times was quite close to the variance you would have if you measured all trees in our uh, in our simulations. But that was that was a simulation. His his program is called Samp Surf. Samp Surf, like sample surf, because it creates a surf a sampling surface that he uses. And I might I might just add quickly that although I haven't heard of anyone that has done it, you could use fixed area plots with this exactly the same math. Like at, at every point in the field, you could establish a small fixed area plot where you measured the heights and diameters of all trees and a larger plot where you, I guess you would have to estimate diameters, but so you could, you don't have to use prism necessarily. You could use fixed radius plots. That would be interesting. I think, um, you know, point cruising is, definitely interesting but if people are actually taking the time to measure all of the borderline trees it might generally depending on forest type might not be faster than a fixed area plot um and so when you add on top of that two different well, i guess if you're doing a point sample with big vaf you're already measuring your borderline trees no because you're using a different point so you'd have no you're using the same point the same point, but two different factors. So it could potentially lead to more. So you also, yeah, it would be important to measure borderline trees on both. Yeah. And that's the whole, you know, because I'm now in consulting, and you know, we do this as a as a business, and so um, studying the actual time uh, cost of some of these techniques is also important to me. And, and another thing about plots now is. Uh, with some of our uh, laser devices, it's not as hard to measure a radius, a plot radius, as it used to be, to determine whether a tree's in or out. Yeah, that's true. It's definitely a lot easier now with these, uh, you know, with like the Hagloff system or the Nikon systems. Uh, it's definitely probably a lot easier, and these things. And I, yeah, I think I think it's important to measure borderline trees with prism sampling, and if you don't. I think you can have a tendency to have underestimates with point sampling because you'll tend to miss some larger trees that are further away from the plot if you're not careful. And one more brief thing, I think I was thinking about, I know we're kind of going on on this, but I was thinking about remote sensing. Uh, I, after we talked previously, I was thinking you could use something like big BAF with drones. You could have a small fixed radius plot where you measure stent, entire stems on the small plot, and then assuming it's assuming it's easier to measure tree heights uh, using a lidar sensor, you could have a larger area around that plot where you just measure tree heights. Yeah. I you know I I don't have but, much experience. You know, myself but i think in terms of if you're trying to cut down on uh you know the the time and cost of uh processing those data if you could you know have some way to selectively pick out the ones that you want to process all of the data on versus others you know if you're doing a hundred thousand acres uh, a year oh, yeah. you know that 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 actually could be uh, a very nice tool to have 
if you need to cut down on, you know, I, I think some of these plots are just like, you know, gigabytes and gigabytes of data. And whenever you put a whole cruise together, it's terabytes. And when you put five cruises together, you know, it just gets to be a huge amount of data to process. Yeah. Especially if you're getting stem shots for a whole tree, for a whole tree. Yeah. That would be a lot of data, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't want to talk all sampling because you also did quite a bit of growth and yield modeling in your research. Um, you know, I was uh, office mates with a couple of your master students, Charles Sabatia and Nabeen Giwali. Um, and those guys both worked on uh, growth and yield modeling under you and then under Hild as well. So um, uh, you basically have written the, the models for short leaf pine in that region of the world, right? I mean, you're the guy. Um, when I, I was, up, yeah. whenever I need to look up short leaf models, your name is all over everything. Yeah, I got I got started with that by cooperating with the late uh, Paul Murphy, who was a a four service biometrician, and he was out of Monticello. They had, I think now Don Bragg has that position in, in Monticello. And uh, I had a grant for him to establish over 200 uh, short leaf plots on the Washita and Ozark National Forest. Uh, and that started in the late 80s. And gosh, I, I believe we did five. I can't remember now if we did five or I think we did five re-measurements, and we built an individual. You might think I would want to build a level model, but there were some reasons why I chose not to. Uh, since we were some of our, a portion of our, like we tried to sample a cross section of the population. So some of the trees were large, older trees. So on a fifth acre plot with a low density, Sometimes we would just have only a few trees and you couldn't really fit a Weibel. It was hard to fit a diameter distribution to like five trees, you know. So uh, I chose to use a distance independent uh, growth and yield model for that work. And uh, another thing with the distance, a lot of people have gone to that too because it fits in the FES system. If you want to put those equations in the FES system and you could add other, although it might be somewhat problematic if they were, because they're not measured on the plot, but, but still you can met, add equations for other species easily in a distance independent system. So that's what I chose to use for that. And like most of the systems, I had a base layer growth model a DBH height model and a mortality model. And uh, a guy that helped me a lot on that was uh, Mike Hifschman was uh, a forester that worked actually as a research associate, kind of like Ralph Amateus for me for several years. And uh, he's now a consultant. He actually got a doctorate in agricultural economics, and he's a forest, a consulting forester out of Moscow, Idaho now. But uh, he helped fit those and had several grad students that worked on that. The last one was uh, product uh, worked on worked on that. He's now he's now the biometrician at Monticello. You worked on our new new basal area height, diameter, and and mortality models for those data. And over the years, we added things like using uh, for the first cut, we just used uh, ordinary least squares, which was common at that time. But later, we used mixed models. Tried using mixed models. I think my student Chakra Budithopi was the first one that used mixed models with those data. So what what is your opinion on using mixed models in a forest growth and yield system? Well, one thing that could potentially be good is that you can cal you could potentially calibrate mixed models 
with local data by estimating, gathering data and estimating a random parameter. On the other hand, some, some work, there's been some work that would indicate it might not be that much better than OLS actually were predictions. I think Timiskin out of Oregon State did some of that, did some of that data. So, and you know, I don't want to put words in Mike's mouth, but I have heard him state, you know, his reservations because the parameter estimates 100% depend on the uh, distribution you put on the random uh, parameters. So, if you change it from a normal to a uniform to whatever, it'll affect your global parameter estimates. Mike's true. Yeah. So there's that, yeah. For some of our papers, we presented both the OLS parameters and the, maybe not for all of them, but for sometimes we presented both. Yeah. Um, also, I, I think it's a nice idea to be able to be able to calibrate the model to your data. But, you know, now working in the real world, you rarely, you rarely actually do that. Like if you're running simulations in the office, you're not going to have the data to do that. Right. We, we don't have the data. I mean, you, you, you're basically growing from a survival count or a post first thin, and that's probably it. And so you don't have really a, a history of data to be able to calibrate a mixed model to it. Yeah, if we did a, if we compared the R square for the nonlinear model to, uh, a fit in a similar fit index, you know, without parameterizing the, uh, you know, mixed model, they were similar. My memories, they were pretty similar, actually. Well, when you see some of those equations that already have a 0.99 R square, and you're going, okay, yeah, okay, how much more better can we get in the actual parameter estimates? Now, I realize sometimes you might get a better or a more appropriate estimate of the variance, um, which is necessary if you're making, you know, confidence intervals or prediction intervals. But in terms of the actual estimate, I mean, it's still unbiased, right? So, yeah, yeah. is uh, the OLS estimate is mm -hmm. the predictions are, well, for nonlinear, it's asymptotically unbiased, I think. Right, right. But, yeah. Yeah. But we usually tried to look at different classes of residuals to make sure it was working well over, you know, a range of diameters, uh, pretty well over a range of diameters, range of tree sizes. And also basal area and site, in, site index. But I could say uh, we also fitted equations to uneven age. I just described the even age natural short leaf. But we also had a data set for uneven age short leaf that we got from the old Deltic farm in Timber. We got the data from the old Deltic farm in Timber Corporation that I think they've reorganized now. And they prob they may not be managing natural short leaf anymore, but in the 90s, uh, they had done, they had a lot of plots with repeated measurements of uneven age forest under management, under an even age management. So we fitted, again, uh, distance independent individual tree growth models to those and mortality models. But we had to have an in-growth model for that. If if there's anything worse than a mortality equation, it's an in-growth equation. Like you've probably never had to deal with that, but if you have uneven age forest, you usually have to have an in-growth equation or some kind of regeneration routine and they usually don't fit very well yeah well it's interesting you say that because i do have that problem in even age forests we have quite a lot of volunteers and, well, no, the volunteers, models, yeah. Yeah, and no good models to predict the in growth and of course it's because you you really can it's was that you know, was that stand located next to a mature pine stand that was upwind or downwind or whatever? And then, you know, did it get a lot of blow in from the seedlings in the year that you planted? It's all like really so variable that it's it's almost impossible to predict. But yeah, I have some properties that I work on that 
it's completely a problem and no real good way to estimate all of the volunteers or the ingrowth that's occurring. Yeah, at uneven age, it's all volunteers because they're actually regenerating. I mean, we got we got an equation that was better than using the mean and just using a mean value, but the R square was that was the lowest R square, and that was my experience at Purdue as, as well. And we did have a, they did have a, they tried to control hardwood, but they did have some hardwood basal area, so for that. For those equations, uh, we did have a stand level hardwood basal area projection equation because we used hardwood basal area in the in the pine basal area growth equation. Well, I wanted to ask you. So, um, we you you've obviously had a very successful career in in academia and research. I'm curious, what is it that maybe has surprised you or, you know, the changes that you've seen from the beginning to now that, you know, maybe you didn't expect or that was the, you know, most, uh, you know, surprising to you? What, what, what have you seen? Well, there have been a lot of surprises, mostly not, not always specific to forestry, but, you know, in my master's thesis, I used some punch cards and i started out by taking decks of punch cards to the virginia tech computing center in burris hall by the time i was ending my career we had a terminal that we could use you know so computing power i probably would not have expected we could do everything we needed to on a desktop in my master's and in fact, there weren't any desktops. It, you know, that's the first desk, desktops I saw were, was one that John Moser bought while I was a doctoral student. But I used the mainframe. Of course, by then I didn't have to use cards anymore. And we had a terminal. We had terminals. But, you know, like computing power would be one. I never expected the companies to sell all their land. You know, we thought it would go on. We thought it would go on like that forever. And, uh, you know, of course, that caused turmoil because they didn't when they sold their land, they didn't need research, land management research anymore. Fortunately, I had a sinecure in academia, but a lot of biometricians were scrapped. In, or some biometricians and industry were kind of scrambling. Yeah, and other, other surprises is, well, we knew re remote sensing was going to be big. We knew that. We knew that. So I don't know if that was a su total surprise. We didn't get a chance to talk about uh, Monte Carlo integration, but when Paul, and, Paul Van Dusen and I talked about that, we were talking about how expensive it was to get one measurement on a tree bowl we we realized that probably someday they would have sensors that would get you know maybe hundreds which they're now doing now doing with drones so yeah and uh, i think eventually you know a lot of our equations that we're developing are based on dbh purely for reasons that dbh is easy for a person to measure right um, uh, whenever you go to a completely remotely sensed inventory, are you going to even need DBH anymore? Um, that'll be interesting to see. You could do volume, or you could you could measure the cambial surface area, you know, and maybe that you would think that would be good. The total cambial surface area. Well, yeah, if you're able to get, uh, you know, the volume of the of the stem, you know, for a certain portion, eventually you're just going to have enough that you you know, fit a taper equation or something to each indi tree individually, and then you've got the whole tree volume, right? You think it'll still be, you think it'll still be used for taper equations, maybe? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I, I, I think, at least initially, because they're not going to be able to get a full uh, picture of the stem because of the canopy, and right. also uh, places where you have a very thick understory. Yeah. You're not going to be able to get that portion. But if you're able to get, you know, a, a height and diameter 
you know, combination up a stem, you know, however high it is, you're only going to need so much of that to be able to put a Tabor equation there and get total height and, you know, total volume. Right. That's the most valuable portion of the stem as well in, in economic terms. So the taper, like the taper from there to the tip, is not a big deal economically, probably. Right. But in terms of, uh, you know, forecasting those data or projecting those data, it's going to be important to still have total tree heights, I think. Maybe not necessarily diameters, but until we can get away from a site index based measure of productivity, which I don't see happening anytime soon, we're still going to need to have that height age combination and even age stands. And actually, you'll need taper equations for future predictions because you haven't measured those trees yet. Something I didn't expect was big in the last part of my career, some of my students use big data methods like neural networks and uh that and that kind of thing that wasn't a, that wasn't a part of my education because they didn't partly because they didn't have the computing power then i guess right in which now it's just uh, the completely insane about how far we've come even just in the past 10 years i mean even when i started out as a master student running these big machine learning models was not a thing and now with all of this big data and everything, it's just become the norm. And you see it more and more in the literature. But I'm curious uh, your opinion on using those, you know, machine learning or AI methods for growth and yield modeling. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm qualified because I don't have enough expertise in big data myself. My grad students do. My last two grad students know more about it than I than I did. But uh, I would wonder if the theoretic, if you would have the theoretical structure to allow you to do uh, uh, extrapolation beyond the data, which, like you know, if you have a Chapman Richards equation, you know, or if you have a taper equation and you have a tree that's bigger than a tree that was in the data you can still get a reasonable extrapolation. I don't know if you could do that with a neural network model. Maybe you can, I, that would just be a quick, that would be one question I would have. Yeah, that, that's uh, also a concern that I have is because once you step outside of your fitting data set, I mean, those models just, they don't work very well. They don't extrapolate. Because there's not a theoretical structure that we had with uh, the growth and yield models that had a biological basis like the Chapman Richards model and uh, which of course those yeah. models also have their their own issues with extrapolation the Chapman Richards historically if you don't have data at the asymptote it will not estimate the asymptote properly and then yeah. so once you go past the the range of the data that you've used for model fitting it just yeah, and for pine plantations, you usually don't you usually don't have data at the asymptote. Some people might, like I think Strube may have had some plots that they allowed them to grow in Arkansas. You know, there might be some people that do that do have that. Yeah. Well, I I want to talk about, and you asked to to mention this, but after your retirement, you know, you've you've still doing some research but you're doing a lot a lot of things outside of research so why don't you tell us about your retirement and what you've been doing there yeah i enjoy playing music and i play the mandolin which i learned to play as a forestry student on campus at virginia tech and we had a little group of three of us banjo guitar and i learned to play the mandolin and we were all forestry students and just a couple of weeks ago i was at Kaufman Bluegrass Camp in Maryville, Tennessee, and I and Dick Daniels was there. He also he plays uh, uh, one of our fellow biometricians, a former biometrician. He's a very good musician. Plays mandolin, guitar, and bass. 
And I also do, I like to do Kairos Prison Ministry, which is a Christian prison ministry. And I've done that for 25 years. And I get to play the mandolin there because we have, uh, as part of our, our ministry weekends, we have uh, singing, you know, uh, songs like Will the Circle Be Unbroken or I'll Fly Away or something like that. And, uh, you know, I could play the mandolin with uh, a guitar player, piano, you know, other musicians. I enjoy, enjoy that. I enjoy visiting relatives. And most of my, my family lives in Virginia and Tennessee. And in fact, next week, they're going to give me a, well, later this week, Saturday, we're going to meet for my 70th birthday party in Abingdon, Virginia. Hmm. Awesome. That's exciting. You're going to go get to be with all of your family and uh, have a big bash. Yeah, it turns out my brother owns a second home at Abingdon. So we're, we're going to have it at his house. Wow. Well, that's exciting. I, I, you know, we talked a little bit about it, but I too picked up mandolin when I went to Virginia Tech and have been enjoying playing bluegrass music for the past mm, about 12 years now. Um, I'm not very good, but I very much love to do it. <laughs> I used to be in a band in Oklahoma. I had a friend that played very good banjo and a good, another that played guitar and for the last few years, we even had a bass player, but we just played in uh, like churches and it was very amateur. We didn't play and if we got any money, it was just gas money or something, but we enjoyed doing that. But it's hard to keep, it's been hard to keep that together. I'm not doing that anymore, but I still enjoy playing. Uh, I go to, and now that I'm retired, I can go to some of these music camps, you know, play there i think we're gonna wrap it up here i want to tell you i very much appreciate you coming on the podcast and i've had so much fun so um really thank you thank you i enjoyed it yeah uh one last question are you going to make it to the southern mensurationist northern mensurationist meeting in tennessee this year i think so yeah i'm planning to present something on big baf sampling awesome well very much look forward to seeing you there and i hope everybody who's listening y'all make it out and if you get a chance come say hi to tom and introduce yourself and talk about big baf or playing the mandolin yeah <laughs> all right well, hang on a minute we'll have a, a quick chat after this over but thank you everybody yeah. for listening and we'll see you next time <laughs>